Call of Cthulhu is a really fun role-playing game, but its character creation chapter goes on for 20 pages. That's not uncommon. A lot of rule books are very verbose about these starting steps. And while that's useful probably for some readers, I have a theory that whatever game you're starting, the build process shouldn't take you any longer than a quarter of an hour unless you choose to spend longer on it. The quickfire method on page 48 of the Keeper's Rulebook for Call of Cthulhu is the fastest way to get playing Call of Cthulhu. However, some steps in that method amount to go read page 32, so what looks quick can slow you down in the end. My method uses the quickfire method for guidance, but adds context to the choices you're making and allows for greater flexibility in the build. This is not, however, an optimized build. The goal isn't to build the most powerful investigator or the smartest investigator, it's to build an investigator quickly so you can start playing the game. This is how I build characters for the Call of Cthulhu RPG in just 12 minutes. Step 1. Characteristics. Roll some dice to determine your stats. There are two kinds of die rolls you need to make. For some, you roll 3d6 and multiply the total by 5. For others, you roll 2d6, add 6, and then multiply the total by 5. 3d6 times 5 is strength, constitution, dexterity, power, appearance, and luck. 2d6 plus 6 times 5 is intelligence, size, and education. Alternately, just use the standard array from the quickfire method. 40, 50, 50, 50, 60, 60, 70, and 80. Step 2. Movement rate. How fast you move, which is significant when you're being chased or when you're in combat, is affected by your strength and size. Your movement is 7 if your dex and strength are both less than your size. Your movement is 8 if your strength or dexterity is less than or equal to size, or strength and dexterity and size are all equal to each other. Your movement is 9 if your strength and your dexterity are greater than your size. Step 3. Pick an age. You get to set your own age, but be aware that your age does affect your characteristic stats. Some allow you to make an improvement check to your education score. To make an improvement check, you roll a d100. If you roll above your education score, then roll a d10 and add that many points to your education. If you've never rolled a d100 before, I have a separate video on that, check it out. If you choose 15 to 19 for your age, subtract 5 points between your strength and size stats. Subtract 5 points from education, and then make a new roll for luck. If it's higher than what you've already rolled, keep the higher of the two. Age 20 to 39, roll an improvement check for education. Age 40 to 49, make two improvement checks on education, but subtract five between your strength, constitution, and dex stats. Subtract five points from appearance, and subtract one point from movement. Age 50 to 59, make three improvement checks on education, remove 10 points between strength, constitution, and dexterity, deduct 10 from your appearance, deduct two from movement. Age 60 to 69, make four improvement checks to your education, deduct 20 points between strength, constitution, and dexterity, deduct 15 from appearance, deduct 3 from movement. Ages 70 to 79, make 4 improvement checks on education, deduct 40 points between strength, constitution, and dex, deduct 20 from appearance, and deduct 3 from movement. Ages 80 to 89, make 4 improvement checks on education, deduct 80 points, between strength, constitution, and dex, deduct 25 from appearance, and deduct 5 from movement. Step 4. Half and fifth values. Divide each characteristic score, strength, constitution, dexterity, power, appearance, size, intelligence, and education, by 2 and record the value as its half value rounded down. When the game master or keeper asks you for a hard test, this is the number to use. Next, divide each characteristic score, that's again strength, constitution, dexterity, power, appearance, size, intelligence, and education, by 5 and record the value as its one-fifth value, again round down. When the game master or keeper asks you for an extreme test, this is the number to use. To avoid doing the math yourself, refer to the chart on page 
49, or just use a LibreOffice spreadsheet like I do, or use the autofill PDF from Chaosium's website. Step 5. Damage Bonus and Build. In melee combat, you get a damage bonus. To calculate this, add your strength and size, and refer to the chart on page 33 of the Keeper's Rulebook. You also have a build factor, which influences some fighting techniques and chases. This is also provided in the chart on page 33. Step 6. Derived points. Hit points represent how much damage you can take. To calculate this, it's constitution plus size divided by 10 rounded down. Sanity represents your mental health. Your sanity stat is equal to your power. Magic represents your attunement to mystical forces. Your magic stat is equal to one-fifth your power. Step 7. Occupation and Finances. Choose an occupation from the list on pages 40 and 41 of the Keeper's Rulebook, or go by the Investigator's Handbook. There's more occupations listed there. Your occupation specifies a credit rating range, and some number of points you can spend to boost your credit rating and your occupational skills. Occupation skill points are derived from your characteristics as specified by each occupation. For example, the Drifter occupation from the Keeper's Rulebook grants occupation skill points from these stats. Education times 2, Appearance, Dex, or Strength times 2. So, for example, if you have 65 Education and 60 Appearance, that's 65 times 2 plus 60 times 2 for a total of 250 occupational skill points. First, use these points to boost your credit rating within the credit rating range specified by your occupation. In the Drifter example, your minimum credit rating is 0 and your maximum is 5, because that's what's listed in the dis Drifter description. But a different occupation has a different range, so for instance, Entertainer, you have a credit rating anywhere from 9 to 70. More is better, but you do need to stay within the range specified by your occupation. Your credit rating directly affects your finances. Refer to the Cash and Assets table on page 47 of the Keeper's Rulebook and write your character's spending level, cash on hand, and assets on your character sheet. Use the rest of the points to boost the skills listed in your occupation description. In the Drifter example, those are Climb, Jump, Listen, Navigate, Stealth, and one interpersonal skill like Charm, Fast Talk, Intimidate, or Persuade, and any two additional skills. Each skill has a base percentage as a default value, so add your points to that base percentage. If you're not clear on which skill does what, refer to Chapter 4 of the Keeper's Rulebook. In addition to occupational skills, you have a number of personal interest skills equal to your intelligence times 2. You can use these points to boost any skill you want. Step 8. Background. You can develop your background as you play, but if you want a starting point, roll on the random tables on pages 42 to 45. Personally, I find these a potential quagmire for indecision, so if you roll on these tables, force yourself to roll on them exactly once accepting whatever you roll. There's no rule that you have to use the exact statement you get from your roll, so if you roll something that you don't like, just treat it as inspiration or anti-inspiration. Turn the thing you don't like into something that you do like. Jot down a few details about your character on your character sheet and then move on. Trust me, this will develop as you play and you can always develop it further between game sessions. Step 9. Gear. If it's not auto-filled for you, Enter Unarmed Combat into the Weapons section of your character sheet. Enter the value of your Fighting Brawl skill in the Regular column, half that for Hard, and a fifth in the Extreme column. It's not necessary to go shopping the way you might in, for instance, Dungeons & Dragons or Shadowrun. The assumption is that your character is at least 15 years old, over the course of your lifetime you've accumulated the usual stuff, and you have access to whatever gear your occupation implies. If you want your character to own something that you think everyone at the table would stop and stare at you when you take it out, talk to your Game Master in advance. At the very least, make sure it's not absurdly out of reach for your character, considering your occupation and your finances. There's a price list for equipment starting on page 396, and a weapons list on page 401. And that's it! You have an investigator now, and you're ready to delve into the dark mythos of the ineffable Cthulhu. 
Or are you? Well, at the very least, you should know about rolling dice. In Call of Cthulhu, dice rolls are a d100 roll. Your aim is to roll under the values on your character sheet. So, for instance, if the Keeper has asked for a listen roll, and you've boosted your listen score to 60%, then you just need to roll anywhere from 1 to 60 on your percentile die. A 100, confusingly 000 on your percentile die, is a fumble. The best possible roll you can make is 1, or 001 on a percentile die. Assume you hadn't boosted your listen skill at all. The default percentage for each skill is listed next to the skill on your character sheet. In the case of listen, it's 20%. For something more esoteric, like law, there's only a 5% chance of success. And again, to succeed, you roll under the percent listed on the skill sheet. Sometimes achieving a task is particularly hard. In this case, the keeper will ask for a hard check. To succeed a hard check, you must roll under the half value of your skill. And to succeed at an extreme check, you must roll under the fifth value of your skill. That's all you need to know to play. You've got your character, you know the rules. Everything else you'll discover and uncover during gameplay, whether you want to or not. Good luck, and thanks for watching.